Hi everyone, welcome to today's lecture, which is titled Modes of American Realism. What we're going to be looking at today are two fairly interconnected modes of realism in American painting. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Let me just set the time span for you. Although there are a couple of works that predate this, we're really looking at paintings that start post-Civil War and go all the way into the first decade of the 20th century and a little bit beyond that, frankly. The two intertwined thematics that I'm talking about that are oftentimes talked about um, through this term realism are one, one that's fairly familiar, I think, to you, which we find, for instance, in this early example of American po portraiture by John Singleton Copley, Copley uh, whose work Mrs. Thomas Boylston, as I said early on, shows this tendency in American art to really care quite a bit about whether something is a likeness, whether it looks like the thing that it is meant to represent. And so with um, this famous painting of Mrs. Thomas Boylston, what I said at the time when we talked about this was you see in American portraiture fairly frequently a um, an interest in realism that is quite different than let's say you're in Europe and you're looking at a portrait of an older woman where you might idealize her. You might make her look more like what was considered to be um, something that was esteemed in society, which is predominantly the way that women look. You would make her look a little younger, you pretty her up and so forth. But I said back then when we were talking about this work that in the United States, and of course we're talking about colonial America here even, um, American artists tend to see that as a little affected, right? Putting on airs, trying to be more than you were, um, something that wasn't really believable, wasn't authentic. And we get a lot of this in American art. So that's that's one of the thematics that we're looking at, right? This interest in some kind of likeness. And again, just to rehearse these terms, in art historical or art critical language, realism is a pretty tricky term. I mean, we don't know how accurate this portrait of Mrs. Thomas Boylston actually was. Maybe he did idealize her a little bit and, you know, fix a couple wrinkles here or there. Maybe she looked even older than she looks here. We don't know for sure. Um, in art historical or art critical language, usually the term realism is applied to things that are meant to look almost precisely like the original model or the original object or landscape or whatever the subject was, right? You're trying to make it look really accurate to that original. More common is naturalism, something that looks like it's believable, looks like it could be accurate, and yet we know the artist has toyed around a little bit with what the, um, the original looks like when they're representing that original. So uh, for instance, here was Albert Bierstadt's Rocky Mountains Landers Peak. It looks kind of like that area. It certainly looks believable as a landscape. We think, wow, that looks accurate to what a landscape might look like, but it's not realistic in the sense that he has tinkered around a little bit with what Landers Peak actually looks like, making it look like the Matterhorn, making everything look a little prettier than it actually would be and so forth. For the purposes of this lecture, we're not really doing a lot of work to distinguish between naturalism and realism. Instead, we're taking the historical usage of realism to say something that is guided by the original look of a subject and tries to capture that subject. And again, we're going to be talking about manifestations of this. The other thematic, though, um, or the other mode of realism is its historical connotation to a movement uh, in France in particular, although really it's, it's in various parts of Western Europe that this occurs, but it's most easily identified with France, where a movement called itself realism. And in particular, the movement was spearheaded by one man, Gustave Courbet. Um, and in this iteration, in this use of this idea of realism, what we're talking about is on the one hand, things that look like things in the everyday world, a uh, uh, representation in this case, it's a painting called A Burial at Ornan, that looks like an actual burial where he hasn't idealized figures, he hasn't tinkered with 
um, you know, the composition to make it look incredibly organized and so forth. But the other side to realism in this mode is something that is attempting, very clearly attempting to break down social hierarchies or to draw attention to some kind of inequitable situation in the world. In other words, realism oftentimes has a kind of social purpose. You're showing things the way that they really are in order to break through all the falsities or or um, ideological kind of hierarchies that have been set up in a society um, that don't allow you to see these realities of the world. So I'm not going to go into this one in particular. If you took a class on 19th century painting, you would spend a lot of time on a burial at Nor Ornan. All I want to say is one of the things that he's doing here was a gigantic painting. And so people would have looked at this and thought, wow, this is a really important subject. And what he's doing is he's showing you an everyday funeral. It's kind of an everyday person's funeral instead of, let's say, the burial of Jesus Christ or some great leader. In order to say something to the public like, listen, we pay all of this attention to these really important historical leaders, but what makes them any more important than an everyday person? And then he goes out of his way, as I mentioned, to break down some of the expectations of you know, classical aesthetics, perfect compositions with clear focal points and all of that in his painting. Instead, however, I, let me just point to this work off to the right hand side here called the Stonebreakers to point to this other mode of realism, something that is using an accurate representation supposedly of things in the real world in order to draw our attention to inequities or social problems in the world with a mind to raising our conscious about these issues so that we might go change them. In the Stonebreakers, for instance, and this was fairly unprecedented for the time, Gustave Courbet shows you two workers working away at a pretty crap job. Their job was actually to make gravel by hand, to take big rocks and smash them with a hammer, to make them into little rocks, to pave the grand boulevards that were being put into Paris are drawing people into Paris at this time. Um, and of course, they're just, you know, dirt poor manual laborers. Now, before Corbet, a lot of people had represented uh, the lower classes, but they never showed the plight of the lower classes. They didn't show how hard it was. And he really focuses in on how hard this was with the torn clothing, uh, with the bleak landscape with the anonymity of the characters so that you can imagine it could just be anyone or they're not worthy of paying attention to. And of course, with this juxtaposition of two different generations, as if saying that young kid who, by the way, should be in school is just going to have a life in which his trajectory is going to go right into old age doing the same type of menial labor, right? Off to the left-hand side here, though, I want to point to another phenomena at this time uh, and something that's kind of worth talking about at, at some length, which is if we had more time with each one of these artists, we would be talking about how paintings and sculptures and what is of interest in these art forms is also mirrored in other art forms, architecture, literature, music, and on and on. And oftentimes they support each other. So off to the left-hand side here is a portrait. Um, Corbet did this portrait of, uh, of Baudelaire. Charles Baudelaire, an author, fairly prominent, and uh, an amateur art critic, supported realism. In fact, he said that art should be painting from modern life, be painting what the artists saw around them, be painting their experience, rather than, and he had in his mind classical aesthetics, painting scenes from ancient Rome and ancient Greece and never giving us an indication of what's happening in the here and now. Again, part of that larger trend of modernism to say what is important now in your world? What is something from the past that should be left in the past. Baudelaire said, paint from modern life. And Courbet followed that, as did many other artists, including a little bit later than Courbet, the Impressionist artist. 
in the United States, our Charles Baudelaire, so to speak, was Walt Whitman, who, like Baudelaire, emphasized being alive in your present moment, paying attention to the experience of your everyday life, and by extension, as an artist, whether you be an author, like he was, or a painter, painting scenes from the world around you. And so this this lecture today is about those those qualities of realism. Let's say you started with something like one part of realism is not imagining what happened way back in ancient Greece or Rome or in biblical tales, but just focusing in on your modern everyday world and your experiences. Another part of realism as a mode is paying attention to an accurate likeness of things, making a painting look like the thing that it is supposed to represent, or maybe, and this is another kind of quality of realism, making it accurate in a way to even the psychology of the person that you're representing if this is a portrait. And then the final big mode is paying attention in particular to social inequities or problems in the world, particularly the plight of the lower classes or working classes in the world, and raising consciousness about these issues instead of affecting a kind of um, I want to say American dream, white picket fences, everyone has access to wealth and prosperity and can do anything they want. A realist might say, well, that's what we say all the time, but let's look at how things actually unfold in the world. By the way, this is a portrait of Walt Whitman by Thomas Aikens, who will be a major painter in today's lecture. So then let's start with this last of the modes. Let's start with the one that is trying to draw some attention to, if not the plight, the difficult working conditions of uh, kind of the everyday uh, blue collar worker. This is a work by Thomas Anschutz called um, Iron Workers Noontime from 1880 to 1881, somewhere in that. It's not a particularly huge painting. Anschutz um, was fairly limited in the number of paintings that he created, but he spent forever on this one. It was kind of his pride and joy. And then he exhibited it in the um, New York Academy of Design where it was uh, originally pretty uh, respected when he showed it, especially for what they would call an amateur painter at the time. So let's set our historical context. What we're looking at are people who work at an, uh, an iron workers um, factory, very, very difficult labor, oftentimes really precarious labor. A lot of people got injured in these giant forges and iron working areas. Um, so it's the kind of job that uh, younger men tend to work. And then if you get past a certain age, you know, you're pushed off into another uh, realm of work. Um, and let's talk about the rise of these factories. What's going on in America at this time? In the post-Civil War period, oftentimes people will refer to this kind of explosion of economic activity as America's gilded age. And what they mean by that was that the economy was booming. Um, all of those things we talked about in terms of progress and manifest destiny, you know, they're coming to fruition. People have traveled out west. They've started all these big mines. They're pulling natural resources um, from, you know, all of these rich sites in uh, on North America, and they are turning it into material prosperity. Right, so that's occurring. But it's occurring in a way that's that's inequitable. This is the age in which uh, we get the the term robber baron coined, right? Robber barons are people who have some wealth to start with, who through ruthless uh, capitalistic practices tend to monopolize various different um, um, industries in order to attain incredible wealth, right? At this time in the United States, and, and these laws don't change until, frankly, sometime around World War I and after, there are very, very lax antitrust laws. So it's very easy if you are, frankly, uh, motivated and you've got some wealth and you're, you're pretty vicious about it to monopolize a particular industry. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, so for instance, one of the most famous examples of this is an incredibly respected family, you know, the Rockefellers. John D. Rockefeller in the 1880s basically cornered the oil market in the United States. He had about 90%, not only of oil um, production, but also distribution and was probably the richest by per capita standards uh, American of all time. And, you know, so from 1880 to about 1911, he had basically a mo monopoly on oil and made massive amounts of money. There's also very, very, and it's still a case today, man, um, lax tax laws so that if you have wealth, you can find ways to shelter that wealth and get out of paying your fair share of taxes, uh, putting the burden on the rest of people. So it's during this time period, uh, you know, to make this kind of a, a long story going uh, short, that people start to recognize that the American dream of just, you know, rolling up your sleeves and doing hard work and meriting what you achieve, right? This meritocracy of the American dream maybe isn't working for everyone, right? Not everyone has the same access to wealth material prosperity, access to power as everyone else. And you start to see artists represent this in their works, at least to some degree. So in the iron workers um, noontime painting here, what we are seeing are young men, again, showing off of their, their bodies. Uh, to some degree, right? Wearing um, basically tank tops or no shirts at all, taking a break at noontime from a really, really difficult day. But if you look at them, they don't look heroic. They don't look happy. Um, they all seem to be looking, with very few exceptions, in different directions, as if during this noontime break, all they can do is kind of massage their muscles and stretch out and get some water and take a deep breath before going back to work for probably another six hours or so at this incredibly difficult labor. They are, in other words, without kind of conversing with one another, alienated. They are beaten down. They become just a part of the larger corporate machine. As was described uh, by critics uh, in the last 30 years or so, the old individual, that important component of American society, uh, just becomes the worker, right? They're not an individual. They don't have kind of free reign to do whatever they want. They just become the worker for the corporation. Time is now regulated by the corporation rather than by one's own material wants. You work from this time to that time, you get this break, and then you're back to work. You're just a cog in the machine that is operating with you only in mind in terms of producing the op optimum productivity out of you. And we still hear people talked about this way today, particularly in the United States. I mean, I'm sorry, but Jeff Bezos has an incredibly, uh, you know, powerful corporation in Amazon. And when he talks about what your life should be like, it's all built around the job, isn't it? It's like you, your life should be about productivity and the job and so forth, rather than the whole host of other things that it might be about. And so in this work, you start to see those glimmers of people thinking about, and by the way, Anschutz's family owned um, you know, factories like this, start to see people become cognizant of the fact that something is shifting, that maybe that American dream isn't quite there for everyone. This is also the age that has to be noted um, in which you have the rise of labor unions, right? So you have a pushback against these corporations where organized labor begins to occur. And again, you'll get this from the, your text or if you've ever looked into this, when you get the first labor unions or workers trying to organize to put some pressure back on the corporation to get some rights or greater pay and so forth, right? To make some kind of equality occur, there's often a lot of violence going on in these situations. Corporations oftentimes would hire people to break the unions um, 
And on the other hand, labor unions would often use tactics to sabotage the corporations. And so there's lots of bloodshed on both sides. So the, the consciousness in America about these kinds of conflicts uh, was growing and growing, particularly through the 1880s when a number of big uh, events occurred. The other thing you should be aware of, although it's not a part of this painting so obviously, is that this is also the time that the American population explodes. Between 1860 and 1900, the American population over devils. It goes from 31 million to 76 million. And those new incursions of immigration are going to come with their own conflicts, as we'll see um, uh, later in today's lecture. So, you know, if you juxtapose that work that we just looked at with an earlier work by John Nagel called Pat Lyon at his forge or at the forge, you see a shift in the way that people thought about labor. Pat, this is a portrait of Pat Lyon by this artist John Nagel. Pat Lyon was a very successful metalsmith. He started off just doing the work and then was able to turn his smithy into a big uh, factory and made a boatload of money. Uh, and so he shows you himself, let's say, early, in his early years, working uh, the forge himself, showing you how hard work can lead to all of this prosperity that he had. Now, this is a painting from 1826, pre-Civil War, and it's very, very common. I'm not going to say that this, this type of representation ever goes away. We will see it all the way to the present moment of people really believing in the American meritocracy. If you just work hard, you'll get everything you want. Um, and frankly, for some people, it does work that way or work somewhat like that. Um, but you're also going to see these other artists pointing to um, some of the things that get in your way. In fact, in this work, uh, just very quickly, if you look at the background here, this little um, bell tower up here is actually uh, a reference to something that got in his way, uh, Pat Lyon's way, early in his career where he was falsely imprisoned in his youth for a bank robbery that apparently he didn't commit. Uh, and that's the, the tower uh, of Philadelphia's Walnut Street Jail in the background. And then you see this kid back here with the indication being that if he just works hard, he can follow in the footsteps of uh, Mr. Lyon here. But over and again, artists in this time period, and this is a work by Robert Kohler, uh, will point to some of the conflicts that are occurring between these robber barons or the corporate leaders or owners uh, and workers. This is uh, Robert Kohler's famous The Strike from 1886. When he created this work, it's a fairly decent sized oil painting. Um, you know, he is responding to things that he's seen in his own life. For instance, he was uh, someone who grew up in Milwaukee in a working class family, and then he went to Germany for a while to train. Uh, he experienced and was very curious about all of these, these problems that were occurring between big capitalist business owners and working class. A lot of people's, by the way, consciousness was raised by the publishing of the Communist Manifesto in the middle of the century, arguing for workers' rights and the need for a big revolution to overthrow these power inequities in the world. And so he pays attention to it here in this painting. There's a very, very systematic reading of this in your textbook. So let's go through some of the basics of it. Just follow my cursor here. What we have is a setup where on the left hand side of the painting, wearing the top hat, which is almost always an indication of someone with wealth, standing in a very beautiful portico, meaning just the porch or the, uh, the front of a beautiful classical building is the, uh, the corporate owner, right? He's the guy who owns the factory, which is over on the right hand side, pushed off into the distance. And the workers are coming from that factory to confront him in some way. He stands up on the steps looking down at him. He's got all the material wealth. And while they vastly outnumber him, you get the sense that he's got a lot of support behind him in terms of his wealth and what that wealth means in terms of power. His building is beautiful. The factory, although big, 
Uh, it looks pretty bleak, as does all this gray kind of factory smoke in the background around here. And the blasted landscape that they walk through kind of gives you a sense of the difference between those that have this incredible uh, wealth and those who have not. Now, amidst all of these people are also kids. And you see kids in a lot of these paintings. It's a reference to the fact that between, uh, well, we know the count, around 1880 or so, um, there were about a million workers between the age of 10 and 15. Child labor laws, when they were ever enacted, were never enforced. And by 1900, you're going to have 2 million, uh, basically kids, between the age of 10 and 15 working in these factories, oftentimes, uh, you know, at great peril. So they're running around and then people of various different ethnicities wearing different clothes that identify them with different ethnicities. So different types of immigrants are in that crowd. This is a reference to, you know, you come in uh, to the United States without perhaps a lot of wealth and you're beholden to the system as it stands, fitting yourself into uh, these corporations in order to, to make your way. The women that are in this, and there are three major representations of women, the first being right in the center, so a major focal point, are primarily the mediators. This is their role. We talked about femininity and women and some of their roles uh, in a previous lecture. I just want to point out that another fundamental role uh, for women is to kind of tamper down the high emotions of men, to try to reason with them, to be mediators uh, in one way or another. And you see this woman kind of pleading with this man who's like, has his hands out, is just to say, listen, we're in the right. And she's like, I, I understand where you're coming from, you know, just settle down and so forth. This woman over here, if you follow my cursor, closer to the man in the top hat is doing the same thing with her hand on the arm of the man. So another mediator. And the third role, in a sense, is kind of the beggar woman, right? She's got a couple of children. She's very shoddily dressed. She's just hoping that something comes out of this. She's meant to kind of pull at your heartstrings, so to speak. And then, of course, you have all of these more or less angry workers, one who may, may be bending down over here to pick up a rock to hurl at someone. So you've got all of this tension building up here. As a critic of the time, um, once said, this, when the strike was shown at the National Academy of Design in 1886, um, Mr. Kohler has done well to show the earnest group of sweating workmen, quite possibly with justice on their side, but ready, some of them, to take the law into their own hands. He has contrasted with them fairly well the prim capitalist, that's the guy in the top hat, but in trying to rouse our sympathies with a beggar woman, his moral gets heavy. All the same, the strike is the most significant work in the spring exhibition of that year. So this is the beggar woman over here. It's also worth saying, though, that, you know, some of what people will object to, and you hear that in that comment by the critic, is on the one hand, capitalists, you know, someone who's got a lot of money, these robber barons are probably acting unfairly towards the worker bees, so to speak, uh, and people will acknowledge that. But on the other hand, these workers taking the law into their own hand, right, fighting back usually or sometimes through violence was something that a lot of people objected to, especially in the realm of fine art. And it's absolutely worth saying that this work uh, was then published in Harper's, I didn't bring in a, 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 I guess the copy of this, but it was published in um, Harper's Weekly on the 1st of May, 1886, which is of course May Day. It's a day devoted to workers' rights. It starts way early on. Um, only a few days before the famous Haymarket Street incident in Chicago, where um, a number of workers revolted and struck and then um, blew up um, part of a factory killing people. Um, labor organizers were later convicted and executed for a capital crime in that event. And it, it roused a lot of um, 
uh, emotions in the United States at the time, some people siding with the workers and a lot of people saying they had gone too far. Just to show you, Mr. Kohler as well did other types of work. This is Rainy Evening in Hennepin Avenue from 1884. Just a kind of genre scene showing you his own world, right? Everyday scenes of people acting, um, you know, according to their daily habits. Um, these types of forms of genre, this kind of everyday realistic representation of the world are let's say a bit more common than the quite, um, um, what do I want to say? Um, well, than these works that are about raising issues. You can't paint this scene over and over again without being called at this time a rabble rouser. And so, you know, he's going to paint that once or twice a year, and then lots of scenes of everyday uh, activities such as this or portraits such as this, the head of an old woman from 1881. We've already seen Winslow Homer earlier when we were talking about his work primarily for Harper's Weekly during the Civil War, and he's coming back here to talk about uh, realism as well. Um, this is his famous work from 1871 called The Old Mill. And again, there's a pretty good reading of this work in your text. Uh, but it's something that uh, allows me to talk about another way that paintings were used, even when they were trying to address or redress problems of inequities. And what I mean by that is that, as we saw in his, his paintings of the Civil War, oftentimes the paintings themselves kind of tone down uh, any of the, the problematic issues that they might be dealing with. Painters, after all, and when you're creating a painting, you're thinking of a work of art, or at least they oftentimes did, that would endure well beyond the age in which it was created, and thus it had to have a kind of more universal value. They were also works of art, though, that would be shown in the polite venues of galleries and um, yearly exhibitions where people didn't necessarily want to see highly politically charged works. They wanted, and I'm sorry, I still see this a lot today in, in major museum exhibitions. They often want something that might address a problem, but not hit it straight on. And so here in the old mill, which was also titled The Morning Bell, he deals with the subject of women going to a textiles um, factory to work for the day. Um, in ways that, let's say, if you didn't look at it really carefully, you wouldn't think they're, they're, um, they're going off to a day of drudgery, right? In fact, the major figure, the one that's in the red dress, uh, looks like she's just walking across the bridge to go to the factory. There's a nice interplay of factory versus uh, the forest over here that both gives us a, um, a kind of visual... Um, counterpart to the built factory and the closedness of the indoors that she's going into, uh, as well as, frankly, shows you something about Manifest Destiny again in a, a very coded way, like these trees have been turned into this, this capitalist producing factory. And the only minor indication that she's perhaps not looking so much forward to this is the slight tilt of her head downward or the three women over here that are getting a quick chat in before they have to kind of walk into the factory and probably, again, the bells chiming, probably set to work right away. However, when this work, and again, someone like uh, Winslow Homer would be helping to design the engraving, when it was produced for Harper's Weekly, entitled here, The Morning Bell, you see a lot more um, in this version that might make you think what they're doing is not something they're really looking forward to. And just kind of work your way through it. Now there's no forest for a visual escape from the factory. There is the tree there, but look at how spiky it looks. Doesn't look very comforting, frankly. We've got the same character, but she's not in that beautiful red dress anymore, of course, because prints are black and white, who's turned towards the factory, kind of walking off, and then you see her rhymed by this figure in the foreground who is clearly looking down at the ground and not looking forward to this day of work. Another who looks back at us with this look on her face like, uh, look at what I have to do. 
which then involves us, makes us feel sympathy with her. Then if you follow this forward, look at these two, head clearly cast down, uh, these two talking to one another, maybe related a young man. I mean, how old is he supposed to be having to enter this life, probably with little promise of getting beyond it? And very prominently displayed now, the bell that beckons them in for a day's worth of long work. So to recap this, this is really common, where a work that is produced for something like Harper's Weekly, which isn't necessarily high art, will deal with a social issue much more directly than a work that is meant to go on the gallery wall or be exhibited in a museum exhibition, not a museum yet, but the, the academy exhibitions, um, which has a different kind of public to it, one that doesn't necessarily want to have their face pushed into the social problems of the day. One of the other things that is a part of Winslow Homer's work over and again are kind of genre scenes. So that other form of realism, just paying attention to the world that one lives in, to where one uh, is living at the time, to what people are wearing, to how they're interacting. In this case, um, this is a work that's called Long Branch, New Jersey from 1869, where and much of Homer's work was on this, you see people vacationing, basically. Their leisurely life, wearing their nice clothes, being surrounded by a beautiful atmosphere, just everyday scenes of people enjoying their life. Or this work, again, another genre scene, Boys in a Pasture. These types of genre subjects do get popular around Western Europe in the middle of the 19th century, but they have a longer tradition and maybe there's more of them, frankly, in the United States at this time, right? If you think about the highest art form in Europe at this time, academic classical paintings, right? The Grand Manor or, you know, the French Academy paintings and so forth, they start from the premise that the most, you know, like all great art has to start with a grand subject and something like this, two boys sitting in a pasture, chatting the day away is hardly going to be the grounds for high art and probably be something that a lot of people scoff at. Now in Europe, you might paint this and sell it on the streets to people, kind of like cheap tourist painting. In the United States, this is a much more kind of viable, expected genre scene that a lot of people take really seriously and buy as high art. One of my favorites of these scenes, uh, particularly of people playing is Snap the Whip. Snap the Whip is one of those old games, you can probably see it here, where this boy over here is the anchor and he holds on to these other boys and then swings them as fast as he can around and around until the whip breaks and people go crashing off into the distance, right? So it's young kids at a country schoolhouse during their recess having fun, your typical genre scenes. I once, by the way, it still makes me laugh, I once asked a class something like, you know, here are the boys, this is their, their type of game, something that's very physical that, you know, someone probably could get hurt with. And I was asking, you know, where are the girls here? What, what would they be doing? And I'm thinking someone's going to say something like, well, they're rolling hoops behind, uh, you know, over there, which is one of those things that a girl's activity would be. And uh, one of my uh, women students said, oh, they're behind the schoolhouse smoking cigarettes and plotting against the men. Again, a lot of these paintings would be turned into prints that then would be shown in weeklies like Harper's Weekly. So this is Snap the Whip, again, turned into one of these engravings for that purpose. Some of uh, Winslow Homer traveled a lot, so some of his works were influenced, particularly as seascape scenes, by his adventures down to the Caribbean, uh, up into the Adirondack Mountains and so forth. This is a, a work that he exhibited to great popular um, acclaim um, that is called uh, The Lifeline. It's a woman being saved off of a sinking vessel. You see the man kind of, you know, on this pulley going off to get her and then it's pulled back to the, the vessel um, that is not sinking. Um, it's 
it's supposed to be filled with a certain amount of drama for the time, right? Uh, saving someone uh, in this scene. It's set up on, uh, just so we can play around with this, set up on all of these diagonals as the composition, right? So diagonals of the ropes, diagonals of the giant waves, lots and lots of movement, um, the sweeping um, you know, scarf that goes in front of the man's head, which I'm gonna come back to in a minute here. So a big kind of rescue scene, high drama, but also a kind of genre scene. It's funny to me, having uh, studied this work, that critics of the time were really conscious of the fact uh, that this was a woman being saved by a man and that, you know, you could see a little bit of the top of her thighs here. And apparently um, this was a bit scandalous, right? Even though she had to be saved in this way, artists are supposed to represent these things very, um, in ways that, follow the kind of sexual mores of the day, which are frankly just about as extreme as you can get. And so taking some uh, response to early sketches of this, uh, Homer decided to put this cloth in here across the man's face to preserve some of the anonymity here and make it, let's say, a little bit less scandalous, believe it or not. Or scenes like this, the Gulf Stream, um, when he visited the, the Caribbean, he saw all these beautiful colors and uh, dark bodies and will represent these scenes, again, kind of almost like cartoonish, of a man just lounging on his boat with a, with a broken mass. So he should be um, worried about things. There's sharks all over in the water here and blood in the water, but he, he just seems to be chilling. Or these beautiful, beautiful paintings. I wish we had a field trip and could go look at these firsthand. Um, this is called The Fox Hunt from 1893. As he got older and older, more and more of Winslow Homer's work would take an everyday subject, but it would treat it, the painting, treat it in a way that's really about the beauty of the paint on the surface, beautiful colors, beautiful textures, right? Rather than a fox that's been maybe hurt in some way or another and is trying to avoid these crows that are waiting for him to finally expire so they could get him. He's really setting up a scene that, uh, you know, has this wonderful fox fur, all of this red in there, the big kind of overarching shapes of the crows, little dots of red, you know, some kind of turquoise in the water in the background. It's really a beautiful, you know, composition more than it is about, you know, the last breaths of a fox. And that's certainly clear here in the Adirondack Guide from 1894, done during the near the end of Winslow Homer's life, um, where he is painting these scenes. Uh, this is a watercolor, by the way. That are yes, it's a genre scene of an older man, you know, uh, off fishing probably. But it's more than that. It's primarily about these beautiful colors and textures and shapes next to each other. He's being influenced, in other words, by modernism. I'm going to pause here um, and come back in just a sec. One of the most important painters um, associated with realism in the 19th century is Thomas Aikens. Thomas Aikens uh, was trained originally at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts, where he went on to teach for quite a while, and then he, he was summarily dismissed at a particular moment. I'll get into that in a bit. Um, he also did his requisite trip to Europe, where he studied under Jean-Léon Jerome, a major, major French painter in the academic tradition there. And he was influenced by part of that training, although he um, had a huge problem with the affected nature of classical art, um, being very kind of true to the bone American. He was always interested in accurate likenesses, not so much idealism, or at least not some kind of idea of uh, mathematical idealism um, in the world. He, for the most part, was known for his portraits. Um, this is what he did the vast majority of, um, and over 200, by the way. Sometimes he didn't even, I mean, think most of the time he didn't even get paid for his portraits. But what makes his portraits a little bit different than other artists of his age is that 
Thomas Hickens was very interested in, on the one hand, preserving an accurate likeness of what someone looked like, but also trying to give you a sense of what was going on in their minds. So here you see a work called Mrs. Van Buren. Um, and we call this, by the way, and they didn't call it this at the time, but um, we tend to call it this these days. We call it a psychological portrait, like try to get to their emotional landscape as well as what they look like. And you see that here, right? What is she thinking? What's going on for her? He's choosing colors and a particular composition and having her look off one way with her hand on her head, uh, everything kind of slouching to give us a sense of what's going on inside her. Or another portrait, again, same idea. This one's called The Pathetic Song, um, which is meant to reference the fact that she's singing a sad song, not that she's a pathetic singer. Uh, and, you know, you get a feeling of someone who's caught in um, the emotion of trying to, uh, you know, give their best performance. And there's a kind of tension in this work, right, with the woman listening very carefully at the piano and the woman standing in front of everyone looking quite self-conscious, you know, singing her song for this performance. Or this work here that is called The Thinker, which is also a portrait of someone, again, trying to get to their emotional landscape. That's what he did the vast majority of. Um, but, you know, um, what's more fun to talk about are some of his other famous works. One of the big things that Thomas Aikens took from Europe was, and you'll see this in a moment, was um, an interest in organizing a picture very, very rationally. You can barely see it when you, you know, you can't kind of see beneath the, the scenes here very well to see how he organized these things unless you start kind of charting things off. Or another way to put this is when you look at this firsthand, this is a work that's called Max Schmidt in a Single Skull. A skull is a rowing boat. Um, you look at it, it looks natural, right? Two people out on the Skullkill River or more uh, than this. Max Schmidt in the foreground here, who was a champion rower and a friend of uh, Thomas Aikens. And, you know, you got the proper reflections. Everything looks like it's just the way you would come across it. And it's only after really studying this or seeing some of his sketches that you realize everything is very, very carefully composed here. The the angle of Max Schmidt and his single skull is mirrored by the shoreline over here. The distance between these two is the same distance of the space between this and the other skull up here. This skull is exactly in the center of the river towards the, um, uh, the bridge and so forth. So there's this really tight organization beneath the appearance of things. The other thing that he took from Europe was a very um, heavy interest in the human body, particularly the male body. Remember, even though in Europe, the by the middle of the 19th century, one of the predominant forms is the female nude, it had always been the case that the male nude and an interest in accurate anatomy was the, the base of any classically informed art. And while Thomas Aikens did not like idealized bodies in the sense that you just kind of made them up to come up with, let's say, a Michelangelo's David, um, he did like the idea of a careful, attentive study of the body to get it accurate. And he was oftentimes drawn to bodies such as Max Schmidt's body here that is not idealized according to some external idea of what male perfection should be, but rather a body that has been sculpted and honed by an intense athletic activity. In other words, this is a, an ideal body, the athlete's body, that looks the way that it does because this body has been focused on a particular activity over and over and over again and has you know worked towards that so uh, with so much labor that it's been sculpted in the way that it has been sculpted. If we get up close on this, then you see Max Schmidt here singing, uh, sitting in his uh, skull looking back at us, that idealized body. And over here, believe it or not, that's a self-portrait of Thomas Aikens. You can probably barely make this out uh, on the boat. It says Aikens and 1871 when he painted it. It's his own little 
sly way of, uh, you know, signing his work. What Higgins was not particularly interested in was this. And I, I, you know, while he was in Europe, he wrote a letter, many, home to his father. And I just want to give you a quote. This is, by the well, uh, way, um, William Bouguereau's work called The Birth of Venus, a typical example of the female nude of the time. Aikens writes to his father, quote, She, the female nude, is the most beautiful thing there is in the world, except a naked man, but I never yet saw a study of one exhibited. It would be a godsend to see a fine man model painted in the studio with bare walls alongside of the smiling, smirking goddesses of waxy complexion amidst the delicious arsenic greens of trees and the gentle wax flowers and purling streams running melodiously up and down the hills, especially up. I hate affectation, he writes. And that's what he's getting at. This is affected. This is made up. This is idealized, but it's it's over the top. It has no... Um, anchoring in reality. And that's what he was looking for in his works. So again, um, here is the devil holds skull, another scene of athletes, um, you know, oarsmen on the Skullkill River, which is in his backyard, so to speak. Um, I bring this one in to show you, though, that kind of organization of reality that exists at the level of his planning stage. This is the sketch of this where you see very carefully charted out linear one point perspective. That's what all these lines are. All these lines that are receding back into the distance to this one single vanishing point are not just as way of charting out, um, you know, accurate or let's say idealistic representations of space. It's as way to very accurately represent the way that this skull should look in that space. For those of you who've never seen this before, by the way, Linear one-point perspective is based upon this principle where converging lines, so for instance, railroad tracks that run parallel, when they are going off into the distance, they look like they're converging. In linear one-point perspective, everything converges on that one vanishing point. That's the one major thing he took from Europe, as well as this interest in anatomy, but not an idealism of anatomy. Over and over again, such as here in the work called Between Rounds, Thomas Aikens will be interested in male anatomy, in particular athletes' bodies, oftentimes at rest, though, rather than in the midst of an action. So here, prize fighting, right? A boxer and his body being shown in between rounds. Or this one, same subject, different moment in time, Uh, This is a work that's called Between Rounds from 1899, where you see one boxer has been knocked down, stop in the action, giving Aikens a chance to represent that idealized male body. But again, not idealized according to some exterior idea of what perfection is, but rather a body that has been sculpted by its athletic um, experience. He is, and it's, it's absolutely worth saying this, many artists of the time were influenced and used photography quite a bit to help their realism, to help get it right. Um, this is a, uh, a shot from his studio. He was a, a very accomplished photographer at the time of people posing uh, in the midst of some kind of boxing activity in order to see how all the muscles work and, you know, what is strained and what is not strained. He, along with Edward Moybridge, who he he worked with for a long time. For those of you who don't know, Edward Moybridge is one of the original chronophotographers who famously documented a horse galloping so as to prove that horses, all of their hooves are off the same, off the ground at the same time by using this kind of time-lapse photography. Edward Moybridge actually works in Philadelphia for a while and they collaborate with these chronophotography movements or different poses of this man or someone pole vaulting in order to get an accurate representation of bodies and movement. Famous example of all these things coming together in some sense is this one called the uh, swimming hole 
um, which is a work from, let's see, what's the date on this? 1883, in which you see these male bodies of different ages, a man off to the la left hand side, and then boys, uh, you know, in various poses um, to show you that anatomy in a genre scene of an everyday world, all set up again to show you different movements of that male body and frankly influenced a little bit by classicism in the sense that you've got this pyramidal composition. One of the works that I really want you to pay attention to because it brings together a lot of these things is his uh, very famous work called The Gross Clinic, which is a portrait of Dr. Samuel Gross in Jefferson Medical College. So this is an early representation of surgery. I'm going to take you through what you're looking at. We're in a, a surgical amphitheater. Dr. Samuel Gross, who is very famous as a teacher as well as a prominent surgeon, is pausing uh, in order to address the people in the amphitheater that you can probably barely see up here above while in the midst of a procedure in which he's removing part of a diseased bone in the thigh of this person. On the operating table, and if you can't quite read this, this is the th side of the thigh, here's his buttocks, and then his head would be up here being administered ether up above for his, um, for his anesthesia. So he's doing something that was a very difficult procedure. Rather than amputating the leg, he's pulling a part of the diseased bone off so as to preserve that leg. He was very good at this. He's also teaching other people how to do this. So he's a symbol of, an, in some sense, science and science's ability to understand the human body and to preserve it, to save it. This is part of that Enlightenment philosophy of the age. Uh, and again, this man's taking down notes of what he's saying so that everyone can know this for posterity. In the background is Thomas Aikens, who would visit these types of procedures to learn about anatomy and learn about science, um, you know, witnessing the whole scene. Because during this age, when you were administered an anesthesia that put you out, you needed a witness in the surgical amphitheater to look out for your rights. We have this woman, probably the patient's mother, who is expressing emotion. She's cringing away from the bloody scalpel that is held by Dr. Samuel Gross here, thus setting up another gendered dichotomy or binary between the emotional woman and the rational man uh, here. And by the way, rationality is absolutely furthered by the way that the light falls directly on the head of Samuel Gross, thus emphasizing his thinking ability. Now, Thomas Aikens, just for what it's worth, was very, very interested in uh, Rembrandt Van Rijn's work, and he's probably thinking of a precedent of this work by Rembrandt from, you know, centuries before called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. Um, when he represents this scene. When he represented this, he did it, he, he painted this, it's a big scene, in 1875 with a mind to exhibiting it in a famous exhibition of the next year, the Philadelphia uh, Centennial Exhibition, which was a huge celebration of the 100-year uh, centenary of the, the you know, um, founding of the United States. It was going to be basically an early world's fair. So he painted the scene and then he submitted it. And the people who were in charge of putting works in the show said, we're not going to show it. This isn't art. It's too graphic. It's too gory, right? Too much blood in it. This isn't an appropriate subject for art. And so it wasn't actually shown in the art component of that exhibition. Instead, with the help of uh, Dr. Samuel Gross, who had a little bit of power here, it got shown in the medical wing of this centennial exhibition um, where it was accompanied by various little diagrams and um, writings about the procedure that is uh, being, um, uh, that Dr. Dr. Samuel Gross is uh, performing here. In other words, it wasn't deemed to be art, but it could be over there in the medical uh, end of things. And the, the funny thing about this is that, I mean, it's such a big slight for such a major artist 
that um, when that exhibition was over, because Thomas Aikens, frankly, didn't care all that much about money, he sold this at a really low cost. It was like $400. That's tiny for a large-scale uh, oil painting with this many portraits in it. Uh, to Jefferson Medical College, who owned it for years before transferring it to, um, to the Philadelphia Art Museum, where, uh, you know, just a number of years ago when Philadelphia was in trouble with money, they tried to sell this. They didn't end up selling it. But it was uh, valued at that time at almost uh, $50 million, which was the most expensive price tag ever put on a 19th century uh, painting. A number of years later, he comes back to the same subject, surgical procedures, uh, when he was commissioned by uh, Mr. Agnew, uh, Dr. Agnew here that you see just a little off center of the uh, painting in the Agnew Clinic to, to show himself at work. Now, um, Agnew and his students are the ones who commissioned this to commemorate the retirement of this man. And you see all of his students up here again, taking notes while the man stops to tell you what he's been doing here. Again, there's a pretty interesting reading of this in your textbook, but the thing that I really want to point to is in the um, about 10 years between the two paintings, you can see some of the major changes in the field of medicine. Asepsis, you know, paying attention to the fact that, um, you know, clean implements and, and, you know, sterilized implements and clothing are essential uh, to avoiding infection has become part of uh, the procedures of uh, of a surgical amphitheater. Everyone's wearing white. You can't tell it, but of course, all of these medical implements would have been sterilized and so forth. Um, and, and that's, to me, quite interesting to see that. The other thing that is pointed to in your reading is something that's raised a lot of controversy over the years on what you're to make of this. On the one hand, you have very prominently displayed Dr. Agnew over here. He's given his own space. He's obviously the most important figure in this. And then maybe almost as a counter to him, the other one who's at the same angle looking out is the major nurse over here. Now, before this time period, believe it or not, women were oftentimes doctors in their own right. They, they tended to be associated with things that were understood to be women's problems like giving birth or menstrual cycles or doing uh, pelvic exams, something of that sort, right? Around this time period, within the last 10 years or so, they are pushed into the profession of being only nurses, which, while it might sound like a good thing that she's head nurse and in the surgical amphitheater, really put a limit on how far women could go in the medical profession. You couldn't become a doctor. All you could become is a head nurse, which you know, it's an important position, but it's really got a, a, a ceiling on uh, what your professional development can actually be. The other thing that has been a subject of a lot of art historical analysis is the procedure that they're performing, because what they're doing is um, they're, they're dealing with uh, breast cancer here, which some of you may know this. I mean, we still haven't gotten a great handle on this anyway, but back in the 19th century um, was a, a, a kind of procedure that very rarely, frankly, maybe if ever was particularly successful. Um, there's so much, um, so much damage done in the process of trying to remove a tumor that more often than not, People would die on the table of blood loss or infection later on, or you know you wouldn't get all the cancer and they would die anyway. And as your text points out, even Dr. Agnew would say, uh, near the end of his life, that you know it was mainly just to make people feel better, as if you're tr you know trying to do something is better than just letting them die. But it was very rarely, if at all, effective. I'm going to round this out by looking at something that was a big part of Thomas's, Thomas Aiken's um, career downfall to some degree, or rather his dismissal from the Pennsylvania Academy to, of the Arts. Um, he was notorious for kind of pushing the rules. He was very interested in anatomy, as you saw in those uh, photographs. He had classes that were co-ed classes, men and women in his classes, and he treated them both as equals. 
in a longer class, we could spend some time talking about all of the uh, women that he ended up teaching who went on to have very prominent careers in the arts. And one of the things he got in trouble for was having mixed groups paint from live nude models. As I've said in the past, this is a big no-no, right? Women weren't supposed to see live nude men. Maybe they could see live nude women, but n no way were they supposed to see even live nude women in the company of other male artists in the room. Now he did this and then someone who didn't like him very much kind of tattletailed on him, so he got in trouble. So he towed the line for a little bit, but later on when one of his students asked him how a particular muscle attached uh, at the hip flexor, he walked up to the, the model and took the male model's loincloth off, right? And if you've ever been in a life drawing class before, you know there's nothing really erotic about it. You're all so concerned with trying to get, you know, accurate likeness down that there's, there's nothing particularly erotic or sexual about it. And he got told on again and then got in trouble enough that he was either dismissed or he just quit uh, saying, I'm not going to work under these conditions. Here you see one of his sketches, very accurate, of a real body, um, you know, a sketch of a, a nude model in the studio. If you're wondering about the face cover covering, this was to preserve the modesty of the models themselves, which... I don't know, I find it a little bit off-putting that um, you kind of completely cover their face like this. So to carry that through then, you know, the sexual mores of the 19th century um, are what you might expect, especially in America. We're going all the way back to that John Vanderlyn work of Ariadne Asleep on the Island of Naxos. In the United States, we tend to be fairly allergic all the way through until around the end of the 19th century of anything that smacks of eroticism. This is Thomas Aiken's uh, famous work called um, Benjamin Rust Carving His Allegory, or Allegorical Figure of the Schuylkill River. Benjamin Rush was an American sculptor. We didn't look at him in this class. And one of his most famous sculptures is this work here off to the right, which is a, it was originally a wood sculpture, an allegory of this famous river in Pennsylvania with a bitern on its shoulder. It was actually set up uh, at the pump house of the Schuylkill River, a kind of water source. So what we're seeing here is actually Benjamin Rust at works carving his model and you see that sculpture over here and then you see the model herself who is providing you know the body that then gets ennobled by the sculptor over here on the right hand side but what I want to direct, direct our attention to is how much work the painter of this whole thing, Thomas Aikens has done to make sure that there's nothing, no kind of inkling of eroticism or improper behavior going on between the artist and the model, which by the way, a lot of people were concerned about at this day. You've got a chaperone over here knitting away. You've got the model here kind of partially clad in shadows. You can't see all the details of that body. You can barely see a little bit from behind, but nothing from the front. And then way, way far away over here, you see Mr. Rush carving away, not even looking at her. It's as if to temper down any anxiety that might exist in the American public about what those you know, bohemian artists were doing to their women models. And he took this, by the way, from his teacher. This is Jean-Léon Jerome's famous work called The Artist and His Model here where something similar is going on. This is that French artist, very classically trained. And you see the, um, the artist carving away, idealizing next to the model over here, but it's an older artist. He's wearing gloves. He doesn't look at her, right? There's no improper behavior going on here. And again, people were kind of anxious about this because let's face it, a lot of artists were, um, you know, having sexual relationships with their, their models. After Thomas Aikens gets fired, though, or quits, he decides, I'm not going to, uh, you know, follow those rules anymore. And so this is the exact same work um, or a different version of that work uh, from about 10 years later. And now you've got the artist and the model kind of hand in hand. 
So we're going to finish this up by looking at one of the first major modern movements, but um, I'm going to break this lecture into two parts. So we'll pause here for part number one. And when we come back, we'll start looking at works of art from right around the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. And the first major modern movement in the United States, a group that later became known as the Ashcan School.